to measure several different properties of soft matter using small amounts of sample. Right. So to start, SACS, also known as small angle X-ray scattering, is a technique that measures intensity of scattered light, normally X-ray light, right? Sorry, X-ray light, at versus different angles, normally small angles, right? It's a technique that relies in good statistics. You are not analyzing when you are considering a, a dispersion of particles, for example, or a thin film. You are not analyzing a small one or a small population. You analyze thousands, several thousands of particles at the same time, so it's a technique that relies on good statistics. The main uh, applications of these scattered X-rays are the when you have when you need to characterize large structures using small angle X-rays, or when you need to characterize a small X structure using wide or large X-ray scattering, right? So here we have a basic demonstrative of an X-ray scattering instrument. We have normally the X-ray source, a couple with a monochromator, and then we have the optics, optics to, direct, to refine and to direction the X-rays throughout the sample. Then we have the sample, and this is part is the detector region that can normally is able to move, and depend on, depending on the region, you can have different results, different parameters for, from your sample, right? Good. This is normally the results we obtain from a sex analysis. This is the 1D plot reduced from the 2D scattering, from the 2D uh, images, right? Mainly, the important part on this plot is we have the in in scattered intensity as the y-axis and the distance from the detector from the sample in the x basis, the Q value also known as the Q value. What can we determine from uh, a, sub, uh, sex, a sex, sorry, set up a sex analysis? What we can we also, also, what can we analyze in an instrument like this? All these materials from nanoparticles, proteins, enzymes, surfactants, liquid crystal, catalysts, mesoporous materials, polymers, fibers, surfaces, thin films, and a lot of other samples. This instrument allows you to characterize solid, liquid, and gaseous samples and mixture in different mixtures in different phases as well. And what can we obtain from this analysis? We can determine, among others, the size and size distribution, the shape of the particles, the internal and external structure for structures like core shell, for example, porosity, specific surface area, crystallinity, and orientation. From the main measurements, we can use different regions on the plots and also use different softwares to extract, extract different information from these curves, right? The most basic are the Guinea region, right in the beginning of the curve, where, where you can estimate the size of particles, for example. Then we have the Kratky plot that is normally used for determining the folding state of polymers or proteins, enzymes, for example. Then we have the peak analysis, the deconvolution of peaks that are normally uh, used to determine external structure, surface-specific area, porosity of materials. And another example, we have the slope analysis from the whole curve, where we can determine the morphology, the shape of uh, the material you are analyzing. Besides that, we have these more applied calculations that normally are, are, are refinement done after the initial analysis, where we can use the Fourier transformation, the model fitting, the Monte Carlo approach, to the and which one has its own softwares. One of the most used is the ATSS, for example, where you can determine, uh, a, we can create a three-dimensional three image of the particle of the material we are analyzing, right? Good. So for today, as we are talking about soft matter, uh, I bring some examples of materials that can be uh, related to soft materials that can be analyzed by sex 
and I'm gonna show up some examples in the next slides, right? So the first example is a setup where we used real sex of surfactants for millimolar and onion-like mesophase. So for these experiments, it was used uh, sex from Anton Parr. I'm gonna show the instrument in my last slide. And this module here that is very important is it, it, it is sorry, a real meter head that we can use up to 200 degrees and the minimum torque is 10 nano newton per meter. So with this setup in the instrument, we can also work with the continuous rotation of the sample and uh, with the spinner, sorry, and with the rotational orientation. This is the moving head of the real meter, the real meter head. Of course, this is the cup, and the head is inside this cup. It's called, so-called, the real meter geometry. With this setup, we can work in two different configurations. First of all, then, here we have the representation of the measuring cup. The sample to be analyzed will be right here, and this is the concentric cylinder from the real meter. We have just these two possibilities that are here, shown here in the, in the instrument. We can work with the radial beam, where the, pro the radial beam probes is perpendicular to the flow, di flow direction, so the beam will be hitting the middle of the cylinder, cylinder, and the tangential beam, where the probes is parallel to the fluid directions, right? So depending on the setup used, we can get different configurations and we can get different parameters extracted from the material you are analyzing. Well, for this study, uh, non-ionic surfactant we're choosing to determine different properties at different temperatures and different shear stress. So the surfactant used was a mixture, actually, of polyethoxyethylene ethyl alkyl ether with water uh, using 40% in weight. And we know, it's known in literature, that this material under different stress, under different shear conditions, forms, uh, it, it parts from the lamellar structure, or, or well-orientated, to the onion-like structure, different on the conditions. And this kind of structure will change, will give different properties to the surfactant. For example, solubility, diffusion, viscosity as well. And these properties are really interesting from uh, the, the final application of this uh, surfactant. So for these uh, measurements, it was used the actual mode. The Q value was between 0.05 to 2.5, 2.5 per nanometer, sorry. And the temperatures used ranged from 25 to 40 degrees. So here we have the characterization at 25 degrees. We can see with lower shear rates uh, a typical uh, image, a typical result from a well-oriented lamellar sample. And we can see here. And with the increasing of the shear rate, we see the, the beginning of uh, an, an iso isotropic structure is being changed to a, an isotropic pattern. The beginning of this movement we see here. We, we can see the shear stress slightly decreases at the beginning of the curve, and then it sets, settles to a constant value in the, uh, in the, when using different shear stresses on this case, right? Shear rates on these cases. We can see a completely different behavior at 30 degrees just five degrees, just five degrees of difference. We can see the same lamellar structure at 0 0.1, and then this modification here when we increase the shear rate up to 10 per second. The lamellar peak changes to isotropic ring that can be clearly seen here, to a multi-layer, anisotropic ring, a non-so-oriented non orientated structure as we increase the shear rate here. So this is very important. We have two determinations. We have the rheological characterization of this material happening at the same time we characterize it by using sex in the same instrument, in the same setup, of course. Here we have the differences between the arrangement of these, of these molecules with lower and higher shear rates. We can see 
that is the intensity of the X-ray skater is proportional to the product form, we can see this modification and the number of bilayers, the spacing between the lamellar layers, and we can use this Kyle, Kyle parameter that is related to the bilayer flexibility. So in, in lower shear rates, we have much more flexibility in the layers, the, the packing of the layers, when compared to high shear rates. So it changes attendance even at 25 degrees, it changes attendance in modification of the layers arrangement. When we rise the temperature to 30 degrees, we can see uh, higher Kyle parameters, this indicates that the morphology of these molecules is not lamina lamellar anymore. It changes to, to an onion-like. So this is an interesting property of this specific surfactant. The solubility decreases with temperature. So it's really important. We have several surfactants that can be used. So it's important to know which property is better or is worse in this kind of uh, material at these conditions, temperature and shear rate. So, the second example I'll bring today is an uh, analysis of silica nanoparticles at high resolution SACs. SACs. So, the motivation of this work is because this technique in normal instruments have a limitation of size determination for nanoparticles that is around 314, 320, depends on the configuration. Uh, and to have high-resolution measurements of, uh, of SACS data in this, uh, in this re uh, size region, we need to have or higher or high-demanding uh, time-consuming exp time experiments, or then we will have low-resolution results. This is just based on the quality of the X-rays, on the quality of the optics of the instrument, and also the detector. So here, it was used this silica nanoparticle with a known diameter of around 314, sorry, let me check, of 213 nanometers. And for these uh, experiments, where authors used uh, one hour of exposure time with higher performance optics without a beam stop, and the first usable data get what at 0 0.008 per nanometer. So from this, we can see the SWAX wide angle curve, where we can see besides the size of these particles, we can also see the thickness of the shell. So silica are known to be core shell samples, this kind of silica at least. And the size found was 211 in accordance with the 213 specified for this kind of materials. So this is to show how important it is to have a good quality instrument, a good quality setup to determine precisely the particle size of nanomaterials. These slides are really interesting because we are sh uh, showing that in substitution to BAT, physics sorption, traditional technique to determine specific surface area, we can do the same with a sax instrument. This is focused on the mesoporous materials. And the basic technique to use to characterize mesoporous are the physisorption with argon or nitrogen. Several authors uh, discuss the difference between argon and nitrogen, why, why uh, nitrogen is used because it's, more exp uh, it's less expensive, it's an easier gas to work with. Uh, UPAC, for example, recommends the use of argon because nitrogen is a quadrupole molecule, diatomic. Uh, on the same time, argon is a monatomic and non-quadrupole moment molecule. So there are significant differences between uh, surface-specific area determined using argon or determined using nitrogen. Uh, another thing that for to do, to conduct a BAT analysis, you need to degas sample to remove the contaminants, to remove the adsorbed water, for example, to give space for the gas to enter the pores and determine the specific surface area, right? So the challenge of this uh, work was establishing an alternative method to the BAT technique with some different materials. So uh, both techniques have the same limitations specific surface area by gas adsorption and versus sacs. They work with a range of X structures from one to 300 nanometer. 
and the information of the specific surface area from sex analysis is known in this poro region here by the poros lay poros law sorry so for the experimental uh, part, it was used silica particles with different diameters and also uh, a control, a standard that are glass, porous glass. So both materials were analyzed with a BAT instrument from Anton Pot as well and for, with using the SAX.5.0. So we can see that the silica nanoparticles have had a diameter of around 80 nanometers and a specific surface area of 47 square meters per gram. Here we can see the hysteresis in the adsorption and desorption curve. This is typical of uh, a mesoporous material. And here we can see an ice curve from the sex. This dashed region was used to determine the specific surface area. The same we can see here with the pore glass. There are non-cylindrical uh, spheres like the silica. They have a more elongated shape with a specific surface area of 147, 147 uh, squared meters. We can see also the hysteresis aqui, and this is the pore region that was used to determine the area from sex analysis. So here we can see the results of specific surface area obtained by sex and obtained by BAT. So the plots are with a really good accordance. And this, inter this is interesting. We can see the sex results of specific surface area with, with the gassing, heating the sample, you, uh, putting the sample under vacuum to remove contaminants, for example. That is a process that normally took one or two hours to do or more. And here we can see in the this x axis the same results without ga the gassing. Uh, so this is where uh, this was a really important point. That means uh, that with sax we can determine the specific surface area without the gassing. A really important process when you are talking about physisorption of argon or nitrogen. Another important. Uh, thing that is pointed out in this graphic is that this BAT area were determined by using argon when in the BAT instrument. So it was the first proof that argons, uh, argon is a, a gas that can give really good results uh, when compared to the sur specific surface area compared to sex, another technique, for example. Uh, previous to this, it was only compared to the uh, surface area results using nitrogen and using argon. Then we have a proof that argon has also works very well, but because we are comparing to another kind of technique to determine sur specific surface area. This is a paper published in 2022. So here we have another example to the using ultra small angle X-ray to determine, to characterize bigger structures. For this example, it was used this setup, that is a setup uh, exclusive from the Anton Parr instrument, where we uh, authors measure silica uh, microparticles with diameter of 1.53. This uh, suspension of silica particles was, start, was under movement, was being steered uh, in the solution to prevent the sedimentation. So here we have a closed loop and probably authors used silica dispersed in water. And this loop was used to prevent sedimentation of these particles, agglomeration of these particles. Here we can see the basic 1D key plot with the background subtracted, and then we can, the authors used the pair distance distribution function to fit the results of size distribution with a D max of around 1.515 in accordance, well, well 1.52, in accordance with the 1.53 specified for this kind of materials. So this slide is showing that uh, we, using this module in the SAX.5.0 from Anton Parr, you can characterize bigger particles than the traditional 210 to 150 nanometers. We can work with 1.5, 1.6 or more micrometers, right? Well. The last but not the least, we have an example showing the shape of rod-like material determination by sacs. 
here we have a few results of uh, these two different materials, ferric carboxymal tools with a, a, diame a hydrodynamic diameter of around 24.4 nanometers and iron sucrose with 11.9 nanometers. This size was that this hydrodynamic di diameter was determined by DLS, dynamic light scattering, a really well established method for characterization of particle diameter. But this technique cannot determine the shape of particles. The shape of particles can be, of course, determined by the sex results. So, uh, for the ferric carboxymal tools, the calculated pair distance using this software gift will indicate a slightly elongated and prolate shape, this shape here. We can see the basic plot, we can see the pair distance distribution here, and with the maximum dimension of around 17 nanometers, and with the radius, medio, average radius of around 6 nanometers, so the, me the, the medium diameter is around 12 nanometers. From these results, using the, the ATSAS software, we are able to create a low resolution 3D shape of this part of this material analyzed in accordance with the numerical results found from these ferric carboxymal, carboxymal tools. The same was done with the iron sucrose. We can see uh, the material is slightly different from the, the, one found, the results found by DLS. We can see the average length of around 13 nanometers and the average width of 3 nanometers. Using the same software with the same setup in the sax instrument, it was able to calculate to determine this 3D more elongated, uh, like a, a cylindrical shape of this material here, this iron sucrose. Right? So, finishing uh, this presentation. Here is the instrument used in all these determinations that I presented. This is the SAX.5.0 from Anton Parr. Here is the sample holder that you can use with different temperatures, different gases, uh, negative and positive pressure. In this part right here, you can couple with the rheometer head, for example. So it's a really uh, precise, really sensible, sensitive instrument, and you can is and at the same time is really versatile. Where you can determine all this that I showed, and a lot more using only one instrument. So for this, I don't know if I, I am in the, in the time? Perfect. OK, so I'm really glad for your attention. Thank you guys so much. If you need any information, this is my phone, and also this is my email. And we are at the second floor with the cough break space. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> There are questions for Andre. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm here. Ah, hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a question about sample preparation for porosity measurements. Right. Uh, because you focused on you don't need to degaze your sample, but how how is it? It is a powder that you place on your sample holder. Yes. Yes, just simply like that. Yes, just like that. We have different size sample holders, and you can use most of them for powders, and we have bigger sample holder for pellets, for example, and the only preparation is to, well, you, you need, it's not good if you have agglomerated sample, like a block, so it has to be kind of dry, but you don't need the gas, you don't need preparation at all. The analysis of a uh, specific surface area done in these experiments were done at 60 degrees, if I'm not wrong. But we are working on analysis at environmental 25, 20, 25 degrees as well. So you don't need preparation at all. And can it work for um, polymeric film, porous polymeric yes, film? Yes, porous polymeric films. You, need, you, you can use uh, the same sample holder. You just need to make a, a, a coil, for example, with the, the thin film. Then you can use. The important is to have a representative amount of sample. So you can use, and it's not a problem to determine the size of pores in membrane, membranes or thin films, for example, and the porosity as well. It's kind of easy. Hi, Andre. Very nice pictures Thank and you. data. Um, 
Which is the minimum typical volume or mass, let's say, when you investigate real sex? Oh, that's a good question. It's uh, higher than when you use without the rheometer hit, but I'm not quite sure right now. I can take a look and give this information to you. The, the size of uh, amount, the, the amount of sample is more related to the rheometer hit we have with different sizes and different uh, geometries of the rheometer hit. But I believe it's around 0 0.5, maximum, maximum one ml or gram. It's not too much. Oh, it's kind of like two questions. Uh, can you measure the surface area of liquids? And does temperature affect the surface area of solids? Well, it depends. Of liquids, it is not possible. And, but the temperature affects, but it's more related with your sample with, uh, than with the technique itself. So, for example, if we correlate with the BAT, you will have to use different temperatures, cryogenic temperatures, when using argon, when using nitrogen, krypton, this, this normal gas, gas is used for physisorption, but this is more related to the behavior of your sample at that specific temperature and not too related to the uh, instrument setup, for example. This would be kind of like a fractal, right? And Sorry? I was kind of like wondering because like the surface would be kind of like a fractal. And then I was like wondering what was the real surface area that you are measuring? Oh, the real, yeah. It, it depends on the, it depends more on the sample. But it's a good, it's a good question to study and to compare. It's a relatively new technique to measure this kind of properties. But all the results we have until the moment, they are really in accordance with a physisorption, and we are also starting to study chemisorption, the products of chemisorption, the, how the chemisorption affects the morphology of materials by sex as well, too. Okay, let's thank Andrea again. Okay. Thank you.